I grew up on a pig farm in Alberta. Uh, my parents, oddly, are opera singers, at least they used to be. Uh, we heard music all the time. My dad grew up on the pig farm, so he took it over when he got older. Um, and my mother taught singing most of my childhood and even after I left. My older sister plays flute and my little brother plays French horn. So we basically had music going on all the time at home. My mom would play Drop the Needle, that's for um, records when I was a kid and she would sort of test us to see if we knew A, what piece it was and then as we got older it was like what movement, what, you know, that kind of thing. But being part of a farm it sort of gives you an idea of work ethic and getting up and if it's not done it doesn't get done. So you get used to getting your work done and then you can really relax and that's how I grew up and that's kind of how I live now. Um, I'm trying to instill that in my kids. So it's a hard lesson, I mean, when you don't have to get up in the, granted, I didn't get up all the time in the morning, but I would see my dad go out every morning and then at 4.30 every day he'd do chores because you can't take a day off. And as musicians, we often are not given that luxury to take a day off because, you know, there's next week's program to get ready or you have a prelude like a lot of us do or you have uh, small ensembles and stuff like that that you're also working in, in conjunction with orchestra. I wanted to play trumpet because there was a cute boy in the band that played trumpet. And I went to the trumpet professor in Edmonton, Alberta, at University of Alberta, and I said, I'd like to study trumpet with you. And uh, he looks at me and he says, you look like a bassoon player. And I sort of reeled back and thought, is that a good thing or a bad thing? First thing, like, did he give me a compliment or an insult? Uh, and why, why would I look like a bassoon, so a bassoon player? So I looked in the encyclopedia, there was a picture about this big of the bassoon, so I didn't know if it was this big or, this, you know, how you played it. And about a month later, I got my first bassoon. We rented it from the University of Alberta for $25 a year. And uh, I opened up the box and it's in four pieces. Uh, I'll show you a picture of the case, but it looks like nothing. So you, I put, that was my first sort of segue into the bassoon was to put it together. And in my original bassoon, the, the, the bassoon had like a cork here. So I didn't know where the vocal went. So I had this thing. I knew I had to use it because in the picture it came out of the, so I was trying to, I was thinking I could put it in here, I could put it in the finger. So that was my first lesson was basically knowing, boom, you take this out, put that in, and that's the way to get started. Alberta, I had studied six years with my teacher and felt that I needed to move on. The Montreal Symphony had just come to Edmonton and played, oh, they played Marriage of Figaro, Nielsen Flute Concerto, and Mahler One, and the end, those horns stand up. And I remember just being overwhelmed with how great they sounded and how much that that music can take over you, your insides and just sort of, you know, open you up. So I decided I'm gonna go to Montreal. So McGill, I didn't really care who I study with. I just wanted to go to be able to listen to Montreal Symphony. I went there, actually I sent a tape and got accepted, got my degree, and then I went to Holland and I auditioned for um, the Koninklijk Conservatorium in Den Haag and got accepted and got a bit of a scholarship but I also got a grant from the Canadian government to go over and I spent three years there and while I was there my little brother, mentioning my little, little brother, won a job playing fourth horn with the Montreal Symphony for a year. I thought it was enough for me to get back to Canada so I came back to Canada started my masters at McGill again with Whitney Crockett who now plays in Los Angeles Philharmonic and uh, about a year and a half later, I won the job for second bassoon sitting next to my teacher, which is really hard. Let me tell you, my learning curve for that was, you know, I was terrified for three years. Um, but it taught me a lot, and I worked with Charles Dutois, and he's a great leader, and it really taught me a lot. It was, you know, and then it prepared me really to come here and to Boston and, you know, not be afraid. I get along with almost all my colleagues. There are a hundred colleagues, and I would have probably 90 of them over for dinner. That would be really difficult, and my husband would have a fit. But I would easily, and, and when we go on tour, it's an opportunity to sort of hang out with people you don't normally hang around with. I just think everybody's got the same, the same goal. We're all working for the same thing. Um, I don't know, it's a nice orchestra. Maybe that's odd, but I'm lucky to, to have my wind colleagues are wonderful. Uh, they, we stick up for each other. Okay, for example, say we're playing a piece and there's something really, really quiet and has given a section, say, 
the two bassoons. There's a part where we have to come in and it's really, really quiet. And before that, it, there's, say, another group of the winds that plays and sort of gives it, hands it off to us. If they know that for us it's hard to come in that quietly, they'll, they'll bring up the volume. As long as the conductor doesn't get on us, you know, they'll, they'll sort of help us out and just give us a little bit more nudge before we have to go, da, da, you know what I mean? So that we don't do that. If we know that we've got this cushion before us, it's much easier to jump, right? And we do that a lot. Like, I mean, and if it, if perhaps during the rehearsal the people that are playing that before note don't really know, you just talk to them after the rehearsal and, and they'll do it. I mean, it's great. I don't know if that's normal, but it's what we do. Do you want to bring, so I'm going to bring you into my world, okay? So this is Suzanne's world. In my case, I have my family and my husband, and here's my Alberta um, patch. That's my province that I grew up, and a little Remembrance Day poppy, and then just little drawings that my kids make for me. So I keep them in here just to, sort. I look at them, here's a little SpongeBob. This has been the best bassoon of my life. It is, if you look really carefully, you can see that it's got um, um, Sharpie, Stripes, I don't know how clearly, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Sharpie stripes, there's some finger paint that my two-year-old daughter put on the, and I have, she's, she's eight, <laughs> I haven't taken it off. She also put some, some bling on there. She bedazzled my bassoon. So you might not be able to see it from the audience. Oh, I see. Yeah, she bedazzled my bassoon. And I added a few more. I've done talks and the kids always ask about, they go, what, what's that there? And these are earplugs and I will show you, they are a lifesaver because, you know, occasionally you'll be playing, yeah, and the brass, I sit right in front of the trumpets, right in front of the trombone sometimes, and they will be playing very loud and I love it. I don't want them to play any quieter, but, so I have to have, they're really, they're really at the perfect, per there and here. So they're exactly where I know they're gonna be and they can go in in 10 seconds they'll be in. So then they can play to their heart's content. Here's my little case of reeds. So I, this is how I roll. I do them different colors. Um, here's my library series. They're sort of the dark browns with rust. I had a Christmas series. That's like that. That's a really good read. And then there was, this was um, spring last year. So this is kind of old, but I didn't get to it till later. And then the best color is purple. I've always found that purple is the best. Anyway, so this goes best to worst. So this is, these are the two reeds I was using today. But the bassoon uses a double reed, much like the oboe and the English horn do. Ours are much bigger, and they have a lower crow. It's called a crow. It's a good crow. Um, and that goes on the end of the bogle. So when you know how to, where to put the bogle, put the bogle in. Anyway, so I play second bassoon in the Boston Symphony. Um, my first job was playing second bassoon in the Montreal Symphony. I was there from 95 to 2000, and at that time, it was my dream job. I thought I was going to die in Montreal and be happy. And then I met my now husband and my whole life changed and he's American and I thought, okay. Try to think what happened. Boston Symphony came open and I, I put my life on hold for three or four months and did what you're supposed to do and put myself in a room for five hours a day and listened to all their excerpts and did it. And basically, luckily, I was what they were looking for and I've been here since 2000. Second bassoon tends to play the lower part of the woodwinds and you're basically the base of which all the higher colors and higher pitched instruments sort of they rely on you to stay in tune so I the bassoon starts down here that's where all the keys are closed that's the lowest note on the bassoon my world my life um, starts there and basically goes ish that's where where my notes rarely do I go higher first bassoon their, their sort of world would start here. And they play harder than that, but you have to pay me extra for that. My job in the orchestra is to be the foundation for the pitch of the woodwinds, which is a stressful job. I mean, if you're having a bad week, if you're having a bad read week, which has happened, or when you're having just a, you know, you're, I don't know, when something going wrong, you feel it, and the woodwinds, everybody in the woodwinds will feel it. I just feel that live music, you cannot... My husband's an audiophile, and we listen to a lot of records and a lot of CDs. Records are really great, and we listen to these performances and whatever, but nothing, nothing, nothing can give you the same sort of uh, experience as a live concert. Nothing. There will be mistakes. You all become part of the process, the audience and the, the orchestra. We all become part of the experience.